Well, good morning, church. Well, three of you are awake. It is uh, good to have you. I told the first service, uh, the first service was the holy group of people. You guys are the smart ones, right? Stay and hung in for a little bit and then got out. Hope you got here safely and without too much issue. But we're a smaller group this morning. But I'm going to ask you to take God's Word in your hands and turn to the book of First Chronicles this morning. First Chronicles. And uh, we've been in a series we started a couple weeks ago that we're doing kind of in between a larger study out of the book of Acts. For the next two months, we've invested uh, some time and attention on this uh, idea of trusting God and trusting God with all of who we are, trusting God with all that we have, trusting God with our relationships, with our time, our talents, our treasures, trusting God with everything uh, that is important to us. And we've learned that it's hard to trust God. It's hard to trust God and even the small elements of our life because each and every day comes with new sets of obstacles and struggles, uh, things that uh, really tempt us from trusting him. Uh, it causes us to try to be protective of the things that we hold dear. And so we've been learning over these last couple of weeks what it means to trust God, why we should be able to trust God. And today we're going to just address an issue of, of the reason why trusting God, especially with all of who we are, is important. And to do so, uh, the outline's incredibly simple, and yet my hope and prayer is that through the simplicity of the outline, uh, we will quickly uh, adopt and, and make as our own uh, this as a lifestyle in all that we say and do, because if we don't have these concepts or these principles that we're going to learn from our text this morning, if we don't have them locked in, when the moment comes that we have to stand and really make a decision on whether we're going to trust God or not, we're not going to be ready. You know, this uh, last week we started uh, what we do in the world every set of years, and that is the Olympics. How many are looking forward to the Olympics and watching some of the Olympics? Yeah. Uh, it's exciting to watch, and it's exciting to learn some of the stories, and, and uh, these Olympic athletes have been practicing and preparing uh, day in and day out for years, and some maybe even decades, and they've done so uh, living a life of discipline so that when the, dis when the time came, they might be able to perform form at the highest level. And right now, over these next couple of weeks, uh, it's the time. It is the opportunity for them, after all of this practice and all of this preparation, to get it right. And we live in a time, and we live lives where we've got to get it right. And we plan and we prepare for those moments and those times that come in our life that will be obstacles along the way where we've got to trust God. And, and how do we do that? How do we prepare? Well, there are three principles this morning from First Chronicles 29 that I want to address. But before I do, let me give you some uh, background information of what's going on. Uh, this uh, passage of Scripture comes at the end of King David's reign over Israel. Israel. For those that don't know, David was uh, the great champion of God's people. He was the great victor over the giant Goliath, and he was anointed by God to be king. And he takes Israel from a place of, of great turmoil and struggle under the leadership of Saul to a time of great prosperity and uh, just great leadership. And though David was a man after God's own heart, David had sinned in his life greatly, and he had caused great consequence in his life as a result of some of of his youthful lusts and ambitions, and God had dealt with him uh, greatly and brought great consequences into the life of David. And as a result of that, David is wiser and, and, and far more um, guarded in his decisions as he grows older. And one of the things that David wants to do, if you read through uh, the chronicles of, of his kingdom, is David has a desire, he has a dream to be the crowning achievement of his reign, to be the building of the temple of God. This is where God no longer will reside in tents. God would no longer be a God who is on the move with his people. But once and for all, in the city of Jerusalem, David was going to build a temple unto the Lord. The Lord had said he wanted a temple built for himself, a temple where people could come and worship God and experience his presence, a, an ongoing and daily reminder that God is with his people, residing with them as Emmanuel, God with us. 
But here's the problem. As David is getting ready and prepared for this project, as he's dreaming it up and what it's going to look like and, and all that's going to entail in this project, the prophet Nathan comes. And the prophet Nathan tells David some difficult words for, Nathan, or for uh, David to hear. Those difficult words are, David, you aren't going to be the one who will build this temple. Think about that for a moment. You've dreamed of it. You've planned it. You've put together the details of it. You've, you've gathered all the craftsmen to be able to do it. You have spent hours and days and maybe even years planning for something, all for God to say no. Now, this would have been difficult for David because David was the king, and the king is not all too acquainted with someone telling him no. And for some of us this morning, we find ourselves in a similar situation. We find ourselves dreaming and planning, preparing for a future, and somewhere along the line, God says, all your dreams, all your plans, all of your preparation, I'm going to say no to. You're not going to do those things. And it's in those moments when God's answer is different than ours, will we trust what we're going to learn today is that David trusted God. He trusted God even when God's plans and God's dreams for him were different than his own dreams and desires and aspirations. And that's difficult to do for us. It's hard to hear the voice of God when, when we want to go in one direction and God has another plan. You see, what God's plan was is that not David, but his son Solomon would be the man who would build the temple. It would be Solomon who would get the opportunity to, in essence, finish the crowning achievement of his father's reign. So how is it that when we read the text this morning, that we see not a downtrodden, not an angry, not a frustrated, not a, a man who's trying to worm his way around the will and plan of God. In his disappointment, David gives generously and he models generosity to the people of God. He not only models it, but he encourages others to join with him. How can a man whose dreams have been broken, whose plans have been pushed aside, how can such a man trust God in such a way that he could give, we're going to learn, in incredible ways? The answer is David understood three very important concepts. And they are concepts that, quite frankly, this morning, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time and attention addressing because either we get them or we don't. Either we choose that we're going to trust God and believe what God says about himself and about us, or we won't. And so what we see from the text this, may, this today are three things of what it means to get it right. And if we get these things right, then we will live in fellowship with God. If we get these things right, then we will have God's blessing in our life. If we get these things right, then we can know we are living a life where God will say one day, well done, good and faithful servant. If we don't live out these three very elementary and, and basic truths, then we will be living a life of spiritual treason against God. And I'll explain why that is in a moment. But let's go ahead and look at the text this morning. We're gonna look at verses one through 22, but I'm gonna read for, uh, our reading here, verses 10 through 17. If you would look to 1 Chronicles 29, starting in verses 10 and going through verse 17. If you don't have a Bible, by the way, you can find our passage on page 356. Here's what verse 10 starts with. Therefore, David blessed the Lord in the presence of all the assembly. And David said, blessed are you, O Lord, the God of Israel, our Father, forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory and the victory and the majesty for all that is in the heavens and all in the earth is yours. Yours is the kingdom, O Lord. You are exalted head above all. Both riches and honor come from you and you rule over all. In your hand are power and might and in your hand is, it is to make great and to give strength to all. And now we thank you, our God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you and of your own have we given you. 
for we are strangers before you and sojourners, as all our fathers were. Our days are on the earth like that of a shadow, and there is no abiding. Our Lord, O oh God, our, our Lord, our God, all this abundance that we have provided for building you a house for your holy name comes from your hand and is all your own. I know, my God, that you test the heart and have, the pleasure, and have pleasure in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offer freely and joyously to you. Let's pray. Lord, we want to get it right. We want to get our lives right, and in order to do so, we must order our lives in such a way that we know where to put you, where to put ourselves, and then how to respond and relate to you. So Lord, I pray this morning that we would get this right, that we would apply it, and live it out in such a way so that we might bring glory to you, and that we might serve you well in the days that you have for us. Teach us your word and your way this morning so that we might not sin against you. In Christ's name we pray, amen and amen. Three principles that I want you to take a hold of this morning. Principle number one is the principle of ownership. The principle of ownership. If we're going to get life right, we have got to come back to the heart of all uh, that is in existence today. And the question we have as we look to the world is who owns this? Whose is this? And David says over and over and over and over in our passage that he doesn't, but God does. And one of the most elementary truths that should be taught not only in our churches, but quite frankly, in our nurseries, is that God owns all of it. You see, when we begin to start from that premise, everything else will find its place. The problem is, is that our world is filled with temptation to think the exact opposite. That we own this. That the world is our kingdom. The world is our opportunity to make our name great. But David says, who is the king of Israel, he announces to his people, God is the one who owns it all. He uses phrase like, notice in verse uh, 10, he tells us, or verse 11, yours, O Lord, is the greatness and the power and the glory. For all that is in the heavens and all that is in the earth is yours. It is the kingdom that you have because you are exalted head above all. Now let's stop there for a moment. When we say that God is the owner of all things, many of us will give a tacit approval to that. Yes, God is the owner of all things. I got it. Good, we can move on. But I want you to recognize the way that that's lived out is seen in three things. Number one, do you believe and do you live your life in a way that shares and shows that it is God who determines the rules by which we live? Write that down the rules by which we follow. You see, if God is the owner, if God is the ruler, if God is the head of all things, then God alone determines how his universe is going to operate. Now, we live in this world, quite frankly, that says my feelings, my desires, my wants trump everything else. That is from the pit and smells like smoke, if you get what I'm laying down. Because what you need to understand is, it is God who created this world. It is God who had in his mind in eternity past how this world was going to look, how it was going to operate, how the structure of things was going to be set up. It was God who created us, who formed our bodies out of the dust of the ground. It is God who breathed life into us, and it is God who has determined the purposes and the places of which we will live and the way we will go. And so as we approach the owner of the world, we must recognize that he determines the rules. He establishes the laws. He is the one who sets everything in its place. And who are we, O oh men or women, to argue with him? 
You see, Job argue, started arguing with God, and who can blame him? His life had, had really come to a place of great sorrow. And, and in Job, we see he starts to question God, and God says, Job, were you there when I created the world? God, were you there, or I'm sorry, Job, were you there when I put the waters on their foundations? Were you there when I set the mountains? Were you there when I placed the animals and the birds of the air in their places of habitat? And Job had to say, no, I wasn't. And God said in a very polite way, then Job, shut your mouth. Because you are not the owner. You are not the one who owns what's going on in this world. And so because of that, as those who are a part of this place that God has created, and because he owns us and because he, he allows us to live in his creation, that the number one response must be, okay, owner, okay, creator, how should I live? How should I go about my life? How should I uh, pursue uh, purpose and, and a place in your world? And, and I'm not going to move, God, until you tell me what I need to do. Now, this is most seen clearly in our text at the beginning of verse 1. Notice that even the king of the mighty nation of Israel has to stop and get his directions from God. Notice in verse 1, And David the king said to all the assembly, Solomon my son, whom alone God has chosen, is young and experienced, and the work is great, for the palace will not be for man but for God. Now you say, well, what's, what's there? I want to remind you that that must have broken in many ways David's heart. The work I was looking forward to doing, the, the crowning achievement of my kingdom was to build a, a palace for God, a temple for God, to prove to the world how great and awesome is my God. I, I want to build this. I want to do this. And, and God says, no. And so what does David do? David says, God, I'm not going to fight you. God, I'm not going to disobey against you. God, I'm going to trust that your ways are higher than my ways. Your thoughts are higher than my thoughts. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to humble myself under your rules, under the rules, if you will, of your kingdom. And I am going to step aside and allow you to be the exalted one. And I will be the one who follows if the king of Israel can do that, surely you and I can in our common lives. But that's difficult. That's hard when our desires begin to erode at the ownership of God. You see, each and every one of us have dreams and plans and desires, and, and, and we think that because we are far more important than we really are, that we own some of these things, that we deserve some of these things. And that's where trusting in God comes into play. God, I know by humbling myself and placing you in your loving hands that I can trust that you will do what is best for me. That I don't have to vie, I don't have to compete against you, but I can trust you. David came to a place that said, listen, I, I would far rather be a part of the project than to, uh, with God than to lead a project without God. And some of us need to recognize that this morning. And it's a truth that I myself am coming to a deeper understanding of, God, you own it all. And I've got to get out of the way, and I have to be willing, listen, we all have to be willing to play second fiddle to God. We have to, because if we don't, we, like the devil, will go after God in rebellion each and every day. So, he determines the rules by which we must follow. David shows, I'm willing, God, to follow you and go your way. Number two, as owner... Now, right away, if we stop there, God would be in some ways a tyrant, right? He would be a dictator because it's all about him and it's not about his people. And we can look to the dictatorships of the world and we can say, wow, it sure is nice when you're uh, the dictator of North Korea. You get to determine the rules by which people live. And, and we hear stories. Recently, I watched a journalist who went into North Korea. These poor people have rations for food. These poor people have zero electricity most of the night. In fact, satellite pictures uh, just after 
twilight uh, in the Asian uh, area will show all of it lit up as it should with the illumination of the lights and street lights and, and lights from the housing developments. And then there's North Korea, pitch black. And it's because it has a dictator who determines the rules but is not gracious to his subjects. Well, here's where God is, is right away. If we look, say, well, he's, he's a dictator. No, God is not a dictator. He is a loving king who dispenses his riches to all. And so what God does as the owner is he gives now, as Christians, we recognize this more than anyone can because we have experienced what Paul said is the most indescribable gift that God gave when he gave his one and only son to ransom us from sin and from the devil back to God. And as a result of that, we now are children of the great king. We are inheritors of the riches of the kingdom of God. But before you think only the inner circle gets the riches of God, I want you to recognize this morning that the Bible makes it clear that God sends sun to the believer and unbeliever alike. God sends the rains, or in our day, the snow, to the believer and unbeliever alike. God gives the man who hates God. God gives the man who curses God. God gives the man who rebels against life, uh, God life, the opportunity to live. He gives him the opportunity to love. He gives him the opportunity to live in his world for the 70 or so years that we are given in this life. God gives to believer and unbeliever alike. The book of Lamentation says that God's mercies are new every morning. And so this morning, we wake up with brain waves. We wake up with uh, uh, oxygen in our lungs. We have been given a great opportunity. And it's not just the people of God who have been given this, but it is every human being in the world that God has created. God is dispensing his gifts and his generosity and his riches to them all. Notice what David says in verse uh, 11. He says, uh, I'm sorry, verse, uh, let's see here. Uh, verse tw uh, 12, but both riches and honor come from you. You rule over all. In your hand are power and might, and in your hand it is to make great and give strength to all. Now we thank you, O God, and praise your glorious name. But who am I and what is my people that we should be able thus to offer willingly? For all things come from you, and of your own we have given you. And so God in his graciousness and his love is bestowing upon us, listen, God is the owner and he determines the rules, but what God determines, listen, this is very important. What God has determined in his kingdom for you and I and all his creatures, listen, is that it be Christmas day every day. Does that make sense? Every day, God showers. See, we give St. Nicholas a whole lot of fame, right? One day a year, he brings gifts, right? But God, each and every day, gives us and grants us and is generous with us overwhelmingly. Listen, we were sinners. We are rebels against God. We are at war with God. And God gives his enemies love and generosity. And he pours that out more and more and more. And if you can't see it in your rebellion, then listen, you are a fool. Because God is a gracious and kind God who has been faithful to all generations. He determines the rules. He dispenses his riches. And number three, as owner, he demands a return on his investment. He demands a return on his investment. What angers God is that you would live in his house, eat his food, drink his water, work with his strength, move with his bodies, think with his brain, be great with his greatness, and while you're doing that, taking all the glory for yourself and not giving it back to him. 
humble people who are interviewed, and we saw this this last week in the Super Bowl, humble people always will quickly reflect the glory they're receiving to someone else. Nick Foles gets interviewed. The, the long interview that he did um, that night with ESPN was played the next morning, and I was listening to it. And the first five or six minutes of the interview have nothing to do with him. Remember, this is a backup quarterback who's just beat the best team in the NFL, and he's done so as one of the greatest underdogs in football history. And he talks about his parents, and he talks about his family, and he talks about his team and he talks about his coaches, and he talks about all these other things, and then what does he talk about? He says, and then there's Jesus. As great as all these other are, there's Jesus. I would have been, and I would be today, lost without him. And what God is demanding, listen, God isn't demanding your money. God isn't demanding your possessions. What God is demanding is your allegiance. Because once he gets your allegiance, the other stuff is easy. But if he doesn't have your allegiance, then we've got a problem. And the Bible says that God's wrath is being stored up, is being filled up. The cup of God's wrath is being filled up against those who say, this is my world, this is my kingdom, this is my stuff. And when you say that, there's a problem. Because God rightfully will say, no, it's not, it's mine. Does that make sense? And so what we have to do is we have to believe and live out and show the world that we do not live as the king or as the queen of our little kingdom, but that we are continually and always, no matter what people put on us, no matter what accolades people throw our way, that we recognize I am a subject, a commoner in the great kingdom of the King of kings and Lord of lords, the God of the universe who today, just as he did yesterday, just as he has for all of eternity past and will for all eternity future, the King of kings and Lord of lords, I serve at the pleasure of the God of the universe. His name is Jehovah. Do you know him? And so we've got to believe that. We've got to own that. We've got to say, stand secure in that. Because if we don't, listen, we are committing spiritual treason against God. We're fighting against the God of the universe. So once we get the ownership thing down, that's God's job. And we get that God's got his job, and we bless the Lord for the job he's doing, and we're thankful, even though at times we don't understand what God is doing in our life, even though at times we don't understand why God would allow certain things. But we say humbly and with great uh, uh, hope, God, you are better and more able to deal with those things, and so while I, from my finite place, don't get it, I trust you. And that can be very difficult. That can be very hard. So where does that leave us? It's the second principle. It's the principle of ownership, and then secondly, the principle of stewardship. The principle of stewardship. Once we understand that God is in control and God owns all of that, and as David said, you are the head, you are the exalted one, you are the one with greatness, power, and glory, and victory, and I mean, just keeps going with adjectives. You're it, you're the ball game, God. Once we've got that set up, now we, can, now we can focus in on our part, and our part is to be a steward. And to be a steward literally means to be a manager of someone else's stuff. And so now David says, okay, we want to build something for God. We're going to build a great tribute to our God, a place that will tell the world that God is the greatest in all of the universe. And Solomon's temple would be such a place. It would take people's breath away. It would be filled, and as you can see in verses 2 through 9, of every precious stone, of every precious thing, it would take one's breath away when they saw it. And yet, what we need to recognize is, is that at no point 
does David or the people say, we're going to give our stuff to God? God, you've been a good God, and so we're going to take some things that we have in our little kingdom, and then we're going to give it to you in your big kingdom. Notice that David says, listen, even the gifts that we've given you, verse 14, but who am I and what is my people that we should be thus to offer willingly, for all things come from you, and of your own we have given. So what David is saying is, is what stewardship is, is stewardship is taking from God's left hand and then putting it into God's right hand. So it is God giving from his left hand, I receive it, and stewardship says, God, I'm going to offer it back to your right hand. What do you want of my life? What do you want to, to receive back? I want to give all that I am, all of your blessings, because I don't own any of it. I didn't work for it. I didn't create it. God, you did. And because of that, I've got my hands on nothing. I'm not grasping, I'm not, my, my hands are open because it's yours. It's yours. So notice a steward does some things. A steward, first of all, recognizes who they are. They recognize who they are. Notice he says in verse 14, who am I and what is my people? What David is saying is we're small. We're finite. We're broken. We're sinful. You see, when God is big in your life, you will inevitably become small. And when you are big in your life, God becomes small. And so what David says is, God, you are big. And when I see you, and he says this in another passage in in the Psalms, he says, God, what is man that you are mindful of him? How can you be so great and so awesome and concern yourself with a bald man who lives in a house in Hinkley? God, you are so great and so awesome. God, how can you be concerned with a group of people from a place called Sugar Grove? How can you be worried about them and concerned about them? And how can you show your love for them and your protection for them? Surely, God, you've got bigger fish to fry in this world. A steward recognizes that God loves the little things he's created like men and women. And he loves them so much that he has put these little things, even though we were made lesser than the angels, he has made us the crowning jewel of his creation. That while he spared his son when the angels fell, that when men and women, puny men and women, lesser than the angels, the writer of Hebrews says, Remember this, when a third of the angels fell in glory, God did not offer his son. But when man was plunged into sin in the garden, God promised that his son would come and wash clean our sins. Why would he do that? Because he's a good and gracious God. And when we see the goodness and the graciousness of God, we recognize we are small in this world. That will humble us. That will say whatever titles you give, they mean nothing in the grand scheme of things because little people giving other little people big titles don't mean much, right? But what really matters is what does the God of the universe say about you and I? But we, we, we watch, we did this just recently, we watch the award shows and we watch little people give other little people awards and where our breath is taken away, I don't know what to say. I'm so awestruck by your accolades for me. A bunch of rats telling another rat, you're doing a great job. And what really matters is, is as stewards, it doesn't matter what other people say about us. It matters what God is saying about us because God's our boss, he's our owner, and we're managers of what he's doing. So we recognize who we are. Number two, we respond in action. 
You cannot believe God is the, is the owner and ruler of the universe, and you are small and finite, and just believe that in your head and your heart, and leave it at that. That will move you to action. So what does David say? Notice David says, who am I and who are these people that we should be able, that we get the opportunity to offer willingly? <laughs> he goes on and he says, so all that we're going to give you comes from you already. And he goes on, he says, we're strangers before you, we're sojourners, as all our fathers, verse 15 says, were and our days on the earth are like a shadow, meaning we're here today and we're gone tomorrow. And so what do we do with the time we have? We live out this principle and this concept that God is the owner and we are stewards by doing things. By doing things. Now, now these doing things don't uh, put us in a, a great place with God as if God is saying, you owe me this or that. But what it declares in our action is that when I obey God and I recognize that what I have is God's and I'm free to willingly offer it back to God, I'm not going to hold back. This principle was learned upon my son the other day. I asked my son, and he's in here, and God bless him, I love him, my youngest son. I said, son, I need you to go get my pair of pants. They are upstairs, and my son had other things that were going on that were important to me. He says, come on, Dad, come on. I'm busy doing stuff. And then the foot starts stomping. I'll do it, and I hear every step up, and then from the top of the stairs, I look up to the stairs, and as I look up the stairs, here come the pants flying down upon me, okay? Many of us, now listen, that's understandable in a young child's heart, but I got offended. And I, you know what I said to my son? Do I stomp out of here when I go to work so that I can have a house for you and food for you? Do I stomp at, at work that I don't get to go and play with my friends and do all the things that, that old dads want to do, okay? Or do I lovingly, knowing that I get to share this with you, that I get to do these things. You're stomping, you're angry because I've, I've, I've caused you to have to stop what you're doing. And some of us are angry with God, we're stomping with God saying, God, I guess I'll give you this. I could have a bigger TV, a nicer house, a, a better car, I could have more money in my retirement fund, but God, I guess I will do that. No, a heart, he says, is willing. A heart that is free to do so. Not out of duty, but out of delight. God, I get to show you my gratitude and my love for you because of all that you've given me. We recognize who we are. We respond with action because we realize what is important. Stewardship is a test. Notice in verse, uh, let's see here, uh, 17, I know, my God, that you test the heart and have pleasure in, un, in uprightness. In the uprightness of my heart, I have freely offered all these things, and now I have seen your people who are present here offer freely and joyously to the Lord. So here's what's taking place. David says, I don't get to build the temple. He doesn't pout. He doesn't get sad. He says, if I don't get to be the one who builds the temple, my son will. He's inexperienced, and he's going to need help. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to play the part that God will allow. I am going to raise funds. And so what he does is twofold. In verses 2 through 9, we see, first of all, he takes from the national treasury. And he says, listen, here's what we're going to do. We've got money in the Israel bank account. I'm going to withdraw from the Israel bank account this amount of money, and everything is allotted. Notice the gold, the silver, the bronze, the iron, the wood, all of that is listed on what he withdraws. And then he says, well, that's not enough. Because this place is a palace for my God, not just my country's God, but for my God, because I'm going to build a tribute to the one who has loved me, the one who has given to me. He then says, I'm going to withdraw from my bank account, David says, my own personal bank account, and it's all listed there. The gold and the silver. 
and the bronze and the wood and all of the colored stones and precious stones, and it's all listed there. Here's what I'm going to give. And so he has released money from the national treasury. He's released money from his own bank account. And he says now to the people, who will join me? Who loves God so much that they will freely and willful, willingly give to the building of a great tribute, a great temple for our king. Notice stewardship is not a spectator sport. It is lived out in action. And I want you to notice that this action isn't small. These are important things to them. Precious stones, gold, silver, and bronze. These things don't come easy in the world. But they're God's. And they give them. They respond in action. They realize what is important. But most importantly, they rely on God's grace. How are they going to do this? How are we going to do this? Now, we could tell the world that we know that we are not in charge, but God is. And we can say, look how smart we are. We have figured it out. We know ownership and we know stewardship. But I want you to remind you that our minds and our strength and our ability to give and our ability to work and to, to uh, capture this wealth, if you will, all comes from the hand of God. And God has allowed some to capture large amounts of this wealth. God has allowed uh, people both within the house of the Lord and outside of the church to garner great riches. And nowhere in the scripture does God get mad at people who are rich. David was rich. Notice in the, this that when David gives, he gives more personally than everybody else combined. He's the richest guy in the kingdom. And never does it say to David, God never says, shame on you for being rich. But what God commands the rich, and we'll address this in weeks to come, what God commands the rich to do is to be generous with their riches. To be generous, to give in, in generous ways. And David shows that, I'm going to give generously. And, and we need to lead in that. We are the richest people in the world. And you may not feel very rich. If you are poor in America, you're rich everywhere else. And what we need to do is we need to lead in our generosity, not holding it back for ourselves, but to be generous not only with God, but the world around us, because this is not our home. This is our Father's world. We need to realize that, and we need to rely on God's grace. God has given it. God has showered us with it. And we need to rely on it and continue to trust. Notice, he prays a blessing on his son. Oh God, grant to Solomon, my son, a whole heart that he may keep your commandments, your testimonies, and your statutes, performing all that he may build the palace for which I've made provision. What he's saying is, Lord, this is a big task. And it's not big because of the square footage. It's big because it's going to be a tribute to you, God. And so if, I, if we're going to do this right, we need to be prayed up. And that's why we need to pray for one another that we would rely on God's grace, that God would give us the grace in obedience to obey all that he has commanded us to. Because each and every day we will wake up and the devil in this world will tempt us to say, you are the ruler, God isn't. And we need to pray, God, grace us with the reminders that you are in charge, you are the owner, because when I veer outside of that, only trouble will fall. So I rely on your daily grace to meet me in my time of need. Finally, you say, but wait a minute, if we're giving everything away that we have, if we're opening our hands to our lives and to our marriages and to our workplaces and to our families... Surely that will be a bad thing. Surely that will be a scary thing. But notice these people aren't scared. These people relish in the opportunity. Uh, these people gave so much away, sacrificially gave, and you would think they'd be downtrodden and broken, but they're not. It tells us in verse 9, the people rejoiced. They were filled with joy. In verse 22, it tells us that, uh, I'm sorry, verse 10 tells us David rejoiced. In verse 22, it tells us that they ate and drank with great gladness. These aren't a broken up, downtrodden people. These are people that are relishing in the opportunity to live as stewards in God's kingdom. 
And some of us are trying to build a kingdom of our own that we do not understand how great it is to live in someone else's house. I'm watching a show right now on Netflix called Royal Pains. And uh, if you've watched it, it's about a doctor who uh, finds his way in the Hamptons, the beautiful part where the rich and famous live. And the thing I love about, man, some of these, how they're castles. And the whole time, the main character lives in a castle with a billionaire. And he has to be reminded from time to time that he's living in someone else's house, as great as it is. And I think the writers of the, of the show made the decision that he would drive an old Saab convertible. And every time he gets in the car, it's a reminder that he doesn't own anything. He doesn't have riches. He's got an old, worn-down car. And we need to recognize sometimes God gives us some old, worn-down things to remind us that this isn't our home. We didn't buy it. But we are stewards of it. God has allowed us to live, if you will, free. And all he asks is is acknowledgement that he is the owner, that he is the, the king of the castle, because devastation will come when we start assuming this stuff is ours. So how do we get here? How do we get to a place of stewardship? How do we get to a place of recognizing that God is the owner of all things? Let me finish with one more thing, and that is worship. Worship. You see, worship takes stewards and it puts them in their proper place and it gives them a reason why they will allow the owner to live and to reign supreme. Notice that what this all does is it brings them to a place of worship. Verse 20, then David said to the all, all the assembly, bless the Lord your God. And all the assembly, bless the Lord The God of their fathers bowed their head and paid homage first to the Lord and then to the king. And they offered sacrifices to the Lord and on the next day offered burnt offerings to the Lord, a thousand bulls, a thousand rams, a thousand lambs with their drink offerings and sacrifice in abundance for all Israel. And they ate and drank before the Lord on that day with great gladness. How do you get to be at a place of stewardship? It starts with a heart of worship. And with worship comes three things. Number one, it says they kneeled down and they paid homage to him. It involves awe. Worship begins with awe. It begins with a place of recognizing how great and how awesome God is. Now, we've already addressed it, but do we believe that? Because if our heart is not filled with awe, we will not worship. And if we do not worship, we will not see God in his ownership. And if we do not worship and see God in his ownership, we will not understand the concept of stewardship. And so we've got to recognize it begins with a heart of worship. God, you are great. God, I am small. Therefore, I am in awe of you, all that you are, all that you do, all that you've done, all that you will do in the future. When I see you, God, my breath is taken away. The awe-inspiring image that Isaiah saw was what we should see. God high and lifted up. The angels, the myriads of angels upon angels crying out, holy, holy, holy is the Lord Almighty. The earth, his earth is filled with his glory. How much of awe is in your life with regards to who God is and what he is doing and has done? Number two. And number three, I'll write these down for for you all at once. It involves not only awe, but affection and acknowledgement. Notice he says, and he says it four times in our text, blessed, bless the Lord, he says once, blessed is the Lord another time. Uh, And then it says that David blessed the Lord, and he says, blessed are you, O Lord. Four different occasions he uses this phrase, blessing. And we know what blessing is. When someone sneezes, we say, God, bless you, okay? And what we're saying is, even in the triteness of a response to a sneeze, that God in all of his goodness 
would shower them upon you. His blessings, his goodness, his grace. But usually when we talk about blessing, we usually talk about God being the instigator of those blessings or the initiator of those blessings and we being the recipient. But notice David turns it around and David says, listen, I bless you, Lord. How in the world can puny man bless invincible, invisible, all-knowing, all-powerful, ever-present God? How can we do that? Number one, through affection. God, you are the great King of kings and the great Lord of lords, and here is my response as I stand in awe of you. I love you. Oh my goodness, God, how great you are, how awesome you are, and that you would not only know me by name and know the hairs upon my head and know the intimate details of my life, and you would tell me that I can cast all my anxieties and all my cares on you because you care for me. My response is, I love you. And I want to grow in that love towards you because I cannot imagine living life apart from you. And that affection is a deep desire to know and to grasp the greatness of God, listen, in relationship with him. And so what does God want in our worship? Notice the Bible says he doesn't want the blood of animals and the, and the sacrifices. What he wants is a contrite and broken heart. A heart that's ready to love him as he has loved us. It also involves not only affection, but acknowledgement. When he says, blessed are you, bless, bless you, Lord, what he's articulating is saying what he says earlier in the text, where he says in verse 13, and now we thank you, O God, and praise your glorious name. So worship is awe, wow God, you are awesome, I can't believe you do the things you do, how do you do that? It takes my breath away. Worship is affection, it's us singing our praises to him in awe, but also saying, God, we love you, we love you and we want a deeper relationship with you, but worship also is an acknowledgement, Lord, thank you for what you are doing. Thank you for what you have done, the mercies you've given, the grace you have given, and then an acknowledgement that you're the greatest of all. And so when we gather together, why is it? And I always wonder what the unbeliever thinks when they gather into a place. We look at screens and we sing songs to an invisible God. What must the unbeliever be thinking? Well, I hope and my prayer is that they will learn God is incredibly great they will learn that we're in love with this God and that we are thankful and we push back to him all of the glory and all of the renown and we say, great are you, Lord, and most worthy of our praise. You and I will never be good stewards until we become first worshipers. And when we become worshipers and stand in awe, and live in a life and a place of affection with our King, and acknowledge all that He's done, we will not open up our wallets, we will not open up our time or our calendars, we will not open up our dreams, our hopes, our plans. But when we become worshipers, we become people who see who we really are, and we see God for who He really is. And we open our lives and we open our hearts and we open our things up to him and we say, God, I trust you. I trust you because you are the owner. I trust you because you've entrusted these things to me. And so I give them back to you. And my desire is to return upon your investment more and more goodness that I can give back to you. When we understand the concept of ownership and stewardship and worship, we will get it right. And some of us have some work to do because we're not quite there. And just as those Olympic athletes were preparing and preparing for just this moment, we too have a new opportunity in this day to get it right. 
just as David did. And he allowed a legacy to go way beyond what his earthly life would allow. When we do that, God will say to us one day, as he did David, well done, good and faithful servant. You got it right. My prayer is that we'll all do that. Let's pray. Father God, we come before you and we thank you and we praise you as the God, the King of the universe. And we recognize this morning as we have been reminded, who are we? We are small, we are broken, we are frail. And yet you are the faithful God who gives us life and breath. You give us the power to live, the strength to go about our days. And Lord, I pray that as we see you in your greatness and your power and your majesty and dominion, that we would respond in stewardship, that we would give our lives wholly and completely over to you, living open-handedly with our families, living open-handedly with our children, living open-handedly with our relationships, with our jobs, with our possessions, with our um, dreams and desires and passions and hopes. Lord, because that's what you ask of us. And that, Lord, that we would keep our hands open so that we might lift those hands, not clutching the things of this world, but open and lift our hands to you in praise and adoration that you are the great God, the God who sits and, and is continually being worshiped upon your throne, that you have made the earth your footstool, and that, Lord, you have given us the great opportunity as sons and daughters of yours to be inheritors of this kingdom you have built. So Lord, allow that to settle in and sink into our hearts and to our heads that every decision and every action and every pursuit would remember these three principles and would make them a part of the pattern of our life. Lord, it will be difficult to do because the world tells us the opposite. And it tempts us and it shows us what we can achieve in this world and what we can grab in this world. But remind us that naked we entered into this world and naked we shall return to the ground at the end of it. So teach us your ways and give us the grace each and every day. We need it in order that we may put our life in the proper place and we might get it right. Now send us forth from this place, Lord. We have worshiped you in song. We have prayed and shown our dependence and need for you. We've opened your book and, and read and taught from it and received from it. Now, Lord, allow us to experience the great grace and fellowshipping with our brothers and sisters, your children, in love and in peace. Send us forth, Lord, on difficult roadways now in protection and that we may come and go in this new week and honor you in all that we do. We love you and give you the glory for it all. And it's in Christ's name we all pray and all God's people said, amen.